Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Today's topic is the Trinity. It could also be called the Holy Trinity, the Godhead, and this is a big topic. And the, the staff was kind of like, Pastor Mike, do you, are you sure you want to preach such a heavy topic on Back to Church Sunday, National Back to Church Sunday? Are you sure you want to tackle the Trinity, something that has split the church world and Christianity since the Reformation? Are you sure? Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely I do, all right? Here's what I want to say to you as we begin this journey today. I will not be able to answer every question surrounding the Trinity, the Godhead. I will not be able to answer every question. What I can do, though, is present a question and present information to theologians that can then maybe figure some things out for yourself. Begin a study at home. Begin a study to see what you believe and what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Amen? So let's start with this. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible. All right, so if you've ever studied that out and tried to find it, I want to find out about the Trinity, and you go search, it's not in the Bible. The word is not there. It is a word that we use as Christian scholars to understand the Godhead, to understand who God is three in one. We just sang it, right? So the word Trinity at its root, basically means tri-unity. Tri-unity, trinity. Three united as one, okay? Three united as one. And this is the belief that we have for the Godhead. And we first see tri-unity or the trinity in the very first verse of the Bible. The very first verse in the Bible identifies who God is. He identifies himself it leaves no question in our hearts and in our minds as to who he is. He is a creator God. Does anybody know what Genesis 1-1 says? In the beginning, God did what? Created what? The heavens and the earth. Okay? So let's look at it. In the be did you guys cheat? I thought you were theologians for a second. No. In the beginning, God created the heavens and and the earth. This word God here is the Hebrew word Elohim. Say that with me. Elohim. No, 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 no. You got Elohim. 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 Elohim, Elohim is the name of God and basically it just means the word God in plural form. All right? Now don't get freaked out, but I'm going to give you a more accurate rendering of this verse. In the beginning, gods created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, gods created the heavens and the earth. Now, this does not lean us to believe that this is some sort of, um, you know, 29, 35, 55 different gods. This isn't the god of nature and the god of the winds and the god of the waters. We're not talking about that. We're talking about one God in plural form. One God in plural form. But here's the problem. We can't understand that. We can't understand that. And this has been the problem for generations. And this has been church splits and new doctrines and new beliefs because man is on a search to understand God with their own reasoning faculties. The smartest, most intelligent people in the world, theologians and philosophers, they sit down and say, okay, let's understand the Trinity. Let's understand the term Elohim, and they just can't. They can't. And so then we all try to make humanistic examples to understand a God that operates outside of our reasoning. Now, I would also have really, really smart people look at me and say, you're just stupid and naive. You're stupid and naive to just have faith. 
Have faith without fact. Have faith without reason. Have faith without understanding. Um, that's what heaven is. And if you all think you have fact about heaven, you loco, baby. You don't have fact. We have faith. We have faith that God's word is true. We have faith that whatever the scriptures tell us is true. And we have what's called a blessed hope of an eternal life. So this understanding, Elohim, God in three persons, one God who is in three forms, in three, three persons united as one, is called a Trinitarian belief. Trinitarian belief. If you ever heard that term, I know that's a big one. That's, that's on the theology side. Trinitarian belief. Trinitarian belief is going to combat and fight against another belief system of God called oneness. By a show of hands, has anybody ever heard of oneness? Oneness, okay? And I, I'm going to take a moment, and I'm going to look at oneness, not to trick you or give you something else to believe, but I want to give you what oneness believes in order for me to show you what scripture says to combat that. Is that okay? I want to be very clear. Family church does not believe in oneness, but I will take a minute to explain it exactly, okay? Oneness theology says that God is one God. And this comes from Deuteronomy 6.4. One of the main passages that it comes from is Deuteronomy 6.4. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so... Biblical scholars, man, they get all confused and they get all jaded and they get all stuck on numbers, right? Like, I mean, we wanted to have, we wanted to decode the Bible because of numbers, right? And break it all down. So Lord God is one. And so because it says one, he's only one. There's no other. So this is what they believe, right? I am Michael McKelvey. I am one, yes? There's no other Mike McKelvey, thank God. Amen. Yet, as Mike McKelvey, I am a son I am a husband, and I am a father. And so there are times that I have to put on my father hat and be father. There's some times that I have to be son. When I'm with my mom and dad, i got to be son. I'm not father to them. One person who operates in three modes. That, that's oneness. Listen, follow me. That's oneness. I, I'm, try, I'm not trying to confuse you. I am one person who operates in three modes. And although... I intellectually understand that. I do. Theologically, my theological perspective, I can't, I can't say that's who God is. I'm not trying to confuse you. God is not one person who puts on three hats. He can't be. Okay? He can't be. God has to be three persons who is one in unity, who is one in thought and mind and purpose, okay? I'm going to show you. Let's look at this. My whole point is to get you thinking, get you questioning, okay? See what you believe. Let's watch this. In Matthew 3.16, when Jesus had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Who did? And Jesus is the son the sun came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and, we, and he saw the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, descending like a dove, alighting upon him, and suddenly a voice from heaven came saying, this is my son, so that's a father, speaking, in whom I'm well pleased. Did we get this? Okay. I believe that this passage clearly shows Three individual entities operating at one time. The Son is being baptized. The Holy Spirit is descending from heaven like a dove. And the Father is speaking from heaven affirmations to his Son. Okay? This is not one God who said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to descend. Okay, now I'm going to speak. Oh, now I'm going to be baptized. That would be some schizophrenic stuff up in here. <laughs> that would be some schizophrenic stuff. Combining that with the term Elohim, 
God plurality leads us to believe in Trinitarian theology. But Pastor Mike, they're one. Yes, they're one. They're one in unity. They're one in purpose. They're one in mind. They're one in thought. They're one in action. Jesus said with his own words, I don't do anything I haven't seen the Father do. I don't say anything I haven't heard the Father say. They would never contradict each other. They're one in unity. Let me give an example of being one in unity. The Bible says that when a man and a woman become husband and wife, they become one flesh. How can we believe that? My wife doesn't have a beard. <laughs> ah, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> we understand that in a marriage relationship, we are two individuals, but our life should become one. One purpose, one vision, one direction, one checkbook. Woo! <laughs> We didn't become one person, we became one entity, one in unity. I've, had, I've heard the Trinity explained as a three-leaf clover. It's a clover with three leaves. It's okay example, but I don't like it. I don't like it because none of the heads of that three-leaf clover can operate by itself and in and of itself. I've heard it, I've heard the Trinity equated to H2O, how H2O can be water, solid, and gas. I don't like that. I think that leans more oneness because H2O can only be a solid as a solid. It can only be a liquid as a liquid. It can only be a gas as a gas. It can't be all three at the same time. What I do like, however, is the illustration of an egg. An egg. We're going to talk about it this way. Thank you. Yeah, this might get messy. Now, for practical purposes, I know that there's a skin inside of the egg and there's that little white thing, embryo. I get all that. But for the most part, an egg is made of three parts. The outer is called the shell. The next is called the egg whites. whites and the inside is called the yolk. But they're all an egg. Now, I can take this egg... And I can open the egg, and I can separate out the white, the yolk, and the shell. But they're still all an egg, right? This is still an egg shell. This is still an egg yolk. And this is still egg whites all in egg. I can eat just egg whites. I can eat just egg yolk. You eat an eggshell, you got problems. <laughs> you got problems. But do you understand what I'm saying? They are three, but one. But one. Now, they can all operate individually as well. The, the son can be baptized as the Holy Spirit is descending, as the Father is sitting on his throne and saying, I am so proud of what's happening right now. Three in one. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are one God, one purpose, one thought, one speech, one action, but they are not the same. Let's look at it on the screen behind me here. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. But the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. <laughs> and this is the major debate. We sit here and we say, I don't get it. I know. I know. And we could sit here and ponder this all day. We could ponder it all day and decide to decipher and create other analogies like an egg and still not fully grasp who God is because he's tri-unity. There's a lot of confusion to wrap our minds around this. 
And that's exactly what the magnificence of our God is. Like, seriously, if I could actually figure God out, I think it would take something away. I think it would take something away. Because then I'm just as smart as he is. And I'm just as powerful as he is. And I'm just as great as he is. If I could fully figure everything out. I find it funny that people would reject Trinitarian theology because they don't fully understand it, but they believe in heaven. They reject Trinitarian theology, but they believe in an eternal God, a God that never had a beginning and will never have an end. Oh, they somehow understand that, but they can't understand the, uh, Trinitarianism, the Trinity. All facets of God take faith. Take faith. You will never fully grasp God, and that's the beauty of faith. But those who need some scriptural proof, let's go a little bit deeper. Let's study this out. Let's go back to the beginning of time, Genesis 1.26. And Elohim said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now listen. Listen. I know there's a lot of strange things happening in the world today. I do believe that part of people changing their pronouns is to nullify Trinitarian belief. If I started saying, we are Mike McKelvey, we are one, that would be a little weird. But it's how people talk, right? I'm a them, they. That's not what God is doing here. All right? That's not what God is doing here. He literally is three in one. Right? He literally is. So when he's saying, let us, let us, the three of us, make man in our image and after our likeness. And then they all had different parts to play in the creation story. We don't have time to go into creation today. But the, but the use of us and our implies more than one person involved in creation. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I did a baptism one time. Someone asked me, hey, can you please not, can you please not baptize me in the titles of God and baptize me in the name of Jesus? Um, that, that's oneness. Uh, and I said, okay, um, why would you want me to do that? Well, that's what the apostles did. And I said, oh, so what the apostles did is more powerful and important than what Jesus told us to do? A command from God himself. Um, I do not believe that baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is baptizing in titles. I believe that it is literally calling upon the Godhead to anoint and bless that holy moment of water baptism. All right. I hope, I hope that maybe part of you disagrees with me. And I hope that that inspires you to study and not just get ticked off and leave the church. Like, like I hope that you understand that here at Family Church, um, we don't spoon feed. Okay? We prepare a meal, and we expect you to pick up the sandwich and eat it. Okay? I'm going to say it like this. Only babies cry when they're not being fed. Adults get up and make a sandwich. You get what I'm saying? So we're, we're, we're presenting you the ingredients. I'm putting them at the table for you. But you hungry spiritually? Get up and make a sandwich. Get up and eat something. Get up and study your scripture. Get, listen, and maybe you're ornery. Maybe you like being ornery. Maybe you don't like me very much. And you're like, I'm going to disprove him. Man, go for it. I love it. I love it. But here's what you should not do. Here's what you should not do. Do not go read a commentary by somebody else. Don't go read someone else's website as to what they think about the Trinity. Because now you're following another man. What we're talking about is you need to get revelation knowledge from Elohim. Right? Pray this prayer before you go prove me wrong. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus and I ask 
that the Holy Spirit would open the eyes of my understanding, enlighten me to your truth, show me things to come, speak to my heart in Jesus' name. Do that. Before, anytime before you read the Bible, ask the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of your understanding so that you can understand what you're reading. Jude 1, 20 through 21, this is in the New Living Translation, it says, but you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith, praying in the power of the Holy Spirit, and await the mercies of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will give you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. God's love, the Father's love. Here we have it displayed again. We're talking about three individuals operating as one. God in this passage is the Greek word theos, is where we get the word theology. Here we go, Acts 5, 3 through 4. And Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the who? Holy Spirit. You lied to the Holy Spirit. And you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not to sell as you wish. And after selling it, the money was yours to give away or to keep. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. He says the Holy Spirit is God. Right? That's just good theology. You lied to the Holy Spirit, you lied to God. The Holy Spirit is God, but the Holy Spirit is also a separate entity from the Father. The writer says you lied to the Holy Spirit, you lied to God. Now, let's look at the affirming of these three operating as one. Okay? Bunch of verses here. Paul affirms this in Romans 3.30. He says, God is one. God is one. This egg is one. 1 Timothy 2.5, he writes, there is one God. James 2.19, we find that even the demons acknowledge this. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. This doesn't, this doesn't disprove Trinitarian theology. This aligns with it perfectly. We believe in one God who operates in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All right? I do find it interesting that the word God is three letters. G-O-D. I'm going to take this another step. I know it's hard to understand how there are three distinct persons in the Trinity, each with the whole being of God in himself, even though there is only one God. He is undivided, and it should be difficult to understand it. The Trinity is one of those mysteries that we can only describe in part. Although different analogies from creation can help us a bit to understand the Trinity, Ultimately, all analogies fail in describing this mystery, for they attempt to explain the being of God in terms of creation. And this is where we get wonky. As much as I could say God is like an egg, he's not like an egg. He's not like an egg, and we can't boil it down, pun intended, to something like that. We can't put God in that egg carton like that and say he's like an egg. He's not. He's God, and he operates so beyond our reasoning faculties. Nothing exactly in all creation is like God. Attempts to simplify or fully explain this mystery all fail and often lead to beliefs that are contrary to Scripture's teachings. The doctrine of the Trinity is something we will never fully understand, for parts of it are beyond our comprehension. And for that, we must induce Deuteronomy 29, 29, which means, which says this, the secret things belong to the Lord. There are just some secret things that belong to the Lord. And all of our attempts to decode his secrets and his mysteries are going to fall short. But here's, here's what I will tell you. The psalmist David wrote, those who fear the Lord, he shall share the secrets of his covenant. Those who, and let me just take the word fear out, those who honor the Lord, 
those who respect the Lord, those who spend time with the Lord, with them, he will share the secrets of his covenant. I will tell you this, that if you spend time with God for the sake of spending time with God, he will reveal the secrets of his covenant. He will reveal himself to you in a way that you don't have to have tons and tons of creational proof to know who he is. It's, it's, it's extremely important that the mystery of the Trinity be true. Okay, for example, if Jesus is not both fully God and a separate person from God, then he could not have borne the complete wrath of God, died and risen from the dead. Okay? If it was but one God, one entity with three titles, then God, Elohim himself, one person, came down from heaven and became sin. Well, that couldn't be. If God ever, if all God became sin, then he could, would cease to be God. But God in human form could become sin. That he could bore sickness and disease and sin in his flesh on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live under righteousness. This is a big topic. It's big, it's big, it's big. Right? And I'm asking you, don't just like go home and say, ah, I believe in the Trinity because Pastor Mike said so. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Because you're not going to be able to stand before God on the day that you die and say, well, Pastor Mike said that all I got to do is raise my hand and I'm a Christian. Right? You can't, you can't use me as a scapegoat to miss out on what God's word wants to say to you. All right? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, any belief in him is foolish. And those who claim to be Christians in Paul's words, um, of all people, should be most pitied. He said that in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. But we believe that Jesus did rise from the dead. We do believe that he bore sickness and disease in his body on the tree. So in closing, brings us to our last question. Why three? Why three of them? Why not just one? Why not just two? Why not ten? Right? Why not have a God of trees? A God of rocks? A God of river? The God of rain? Why not? Why three? I have no idea. No idea. Um, I'm a failed theologian. I have no idea. Studied it, studied it, studied it, studied it. We could go back to numbers. Well, three is perfect to try it. Triangle and trap. I don't know. I, I, I couldn't actually tell you why three. It just is. Now listen, here's my theology. It is. And because it is, it demands that I study it, research it, and believe it. It just is. And because he is who he is, I believe in him. And we study it. A number of important voices throughout history, Augustine, Aquinas, Gilbert de la Porre, all regarded the Trinity as a matter of faith, even if the existence of God could be partially known by reason, and there is vestiges of the Trinity in the human soul. He said it's a mystery. But there's bits and pieces that we can see in the human soul. We can put parts together, like I am Mike McKelvey, who has a body, who has a mind, and has a spirit. But if my spirit were to operate outside my body, your boy's dead. So although I can understand God who is spirit, God who is body, and God who is mind, he operates as all three at the same time without being dead. And he can send his spirit. And his spirit can live and abide and be with us, separate from sitting in heaven. All three members of the Trinity have different roles. For example, in creation, we know that God spoke the earth into existence. John 1.3 tells us that God the Son carried out those words. And in John 1.3 says, all things were made through him, and without him, not anything was made that was made. So God spoke it, 
Jesus did it. And Genesis 1-2 tells us, while God was creating and doing all these things, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the face of the waters. He was sustaining and manifesting God's presence in all of creation. Three different roles within the Trinity can also be seen in our salvation. God the Father. Come on, you guys know John 3, 16. For God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And how do we have that? Because the Holy Spirit lives and dwells and abides on the inside of every believer, quickening our spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into our spirit, makes it alive unto God. John 6, 38 says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And Hebrews 10, 10. And that will was that Jesus would die for our sins so that we didn't have to. When Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, he and the Father sent the Holy Spirit to bring completion to the work of the Father that the Father and the Son had started. And you can study that out in John 14, 16 and John 16, 7. But here's what I want to tell you about today. This is what... This is what will separate us from many other churches and denominations. It's right in our vision statement. We are a life-giving, a diverse, spirit-filled, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Here, here's the difference right here in John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance that which I have said to you, we believe in the function of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives. Our daily lives. We don't just have the Holy Spirit for salvation. We have the Holy Spirit for daily sustenance. For daily living. And we don't just believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We also believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Acts 1-8 experience. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The Holy Spirit is alive and active today. In both creation and redemption, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had distinct roles. Different functions, different roles, but they worked in perfect unity. And they do not diminish the deity or attributes of one another. So I encourage you, be a theologian on this topic. Be a theologian on this topic. Study this one out. See what you believe. See what you believe. Do not believe me just because I preached it, just because I did some study. There's tons and tons of literature. You can study Karl Barth, B-A-R-T-H. You can study him. He's, a, he, he's a, um, a, a theologian, scholar, who really studied these things out. Um, he, you can read of his works, and I mean, they're old works, okay? I mean, we're talking way old, so the, the kind of English that he wrote in is a little heady. But it'll bring you some thoughts that they were thinking about thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, in relation to who God is. Search the scripture and search your heart. Search the scripture, search your heart. What I want to do for you today is this. Before we do salvation call, I just want to give you a little diagram of how we pray here at Family Church. We do build it off of the uh, teachings of Jesus who said, when you pray, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, right? So when we pray, we pray to the Father. We're speaking to Father God in Jesus' name. Jesus is the doorway to approach the Father. So in family church, say, Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you for all these things. Holy Spirit, I ask you to be my helper. Be my guide. I pray this over our students every day. Bring to their remembrance. This is scripture. Bring to their remembrance all things that they've studied. Help them to apply themselves. Holy Spirit, I pray that everything they set their hands to. So I'm praying to all three. I'm balancing between who I'm talking to. 
I'm going to the Father, but then I'm petitioning the Holy Spirit. I may ask Jesus for something. It's, it's three in one. They're one God in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Maybe you're here today. And maybe you're on two sides. Maybe this teaching kind of just like ruffled your feathers and I'm not sorry for that. That's a great place to be. It's a great place to be to have someone challenge your faith, challenge your doctrine. If it challenges your doctrine, listen, no harm, no foul, like study it. Don't just leave ticked off. Like go see what you believe, but don't do it by reading someone else's blog. You can't do it like that makes, that's not even theology, right? You got to go to scripture. Go to different translations of the Bible. Get a good um, a Bible thesaurus or one of those things that you can break things down. Get a good concordance, all right, if you want to study things out. Just look at the word God and see where he's Elohim and see where he's Theos and, and look at different things, all right? What was my point with that? Where was I going? There's both sides. If you're ticked off, sorry, not sorry. Study it out. On the other side, maybe this is the first time that you've ever heard something like this before. Maybe you're like, man, I've never asked Jesus into my heart. I've never asked the Holy Spirit to be in my life, to, to be my God, to be my Lord, my Savior. Well, then maybe today's that day. Maybe today's the day of salvation. And the Bible just says this, that we are to repent of our sin and go to God, right? And repent just means change our thinking. Man, I'm changing my thinking today. I'm changing my thinking about the Trinity. I'm changing my thinking about God. I'm changing my thinking about salvation. I'm changing my thinking as to what I need to do in my life. And maybe today's that day. And here at Family Church, we try to make it as easy as possible. We want to pray a prayer of salvation with you. And believe it or not, you kind of already did it if you sang the last song. Right? I believe in the resurrection. I believe you died and rose again. That is the salvation message. We, didn't, we weren't trying to trick you. But that is the salvation message. If you said those words with your heart, if you could believe it, the Bible says that you are saved. But let's just make sure. Let's pray this prayer together. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.